Yeah, my name is Steve Ciszek. You know, um, I grew up in Falmouth, Massachusetts. It's a little uh, town on Cape Cod, uh, on the east coast of um, east coast of Massachusetts. And um, you know, when when I grew up, you know, I was always taught that um, I believe you know my parents would tell me if you're a good kid and you did good things, you know, that's how you would go to heaven. And you know, through my youth, teen years. Uh, through high school, I continued to live with that, you know, warped sense of my own righteousness, thinking that my goodness would be able to merit me uh, salvation. Um, but really, you know, all of those years only manifested the fact that I love myself and I love my own glory. Um, then you fast forward, and when we fast forward to, um, you know, graduating high school, I went to college at Carson Newman. Um, it's a small school in Tennessee, so, you know, pretty far away from home. Uh, they consider Tennessee the Bible Belt. Um, but anyway, so, you know, that's where, you know, I really started to, quote, unquote, enjoy myself, uh, not realizing that all this joy that I was experiencing was temporary, you know, living for this world, my own satisfaction. You know, I thought that would bring happiness. But again, I was just like in high school, I was tragically mistaken because, uh, you know, this world, as I learned, can only bring uh, temporary happiness and is, you know, full of corruption. Um, but, you know, 1 Corinthians fifteen thirty three describes the constant struggle that I faced. And it says, uh, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. The company that I surrounded myself uh, with controlled my actions. So when I wanted to have a good time, I'd go out and hang, pe- hang out with people that party. And, you know, when I wanted to relax, I hung out with the quieter, down-to-earth people some would call Christians. You know, there's a lot of Christians in that college. And, um, but yeah, these people were not the problem, you know, spending time with them and, and worldliness would just expose, you know, what was already in my heart that, and that was that I loved the world and I drank in it and that uh, I had no idea, you know, what I was doing was displeasing to a perfect God. And, um, I remember one day I was with a group of friends that had a, that had a Christian friend and she told me, you know, Roy, which is, that was my name in college. I won't get into it, but, uh, she said, you're, you know, you're a nice guy, but you know, I want you to go to heaven. You need to know Jesus. And that struck me as odd because I figured since, you know, I was a good guy, I was all set. I was good to go. And you know, that's what my parents taught me. That's how I was raised. That's what it seemed like everyone else around me believed anyways. But, um, after a while, she got a bunch of us to go to, you know, on FCA event, which is fellowship of Christian athletes. And you might say at the FCA event, um, I heard a version of the gospel that was probably close to what the scriptures say about, you know, Christ and his cross work. Um, you know, I'm not sure though, you know, that that gospel presentation, you know, clearly laid out what it meant to deny yourself and embrace the cost of discipleship. Um, you know, I just remember that first time going, there was a lot of music, you're getting fired up, it was like a concert. Um, and then, you know, they had a speaker there, sure their testimony and I was like man you know this is incredible she just got to play football I've seen him out at parties before and um, you know you know, what is this guy talking about and again I don't know if he laid out the gospel clearly but you know I heard some version of it but anyways um, you know fast forward to April 2006 uh, still going to FCA events and um, I remember in April I made a profession of faith and it, you know quote unquote accepted Christ in my life um, you know while in that moment I probably thought it was genuine I was really more scared of hearing the word hell. So I figured if I accept Christ and go to church and get in the Bible, um, you know, then I would see that I would see this and I'm good to go. But the difference was where I didn't know Jesus before I would let Jesus into my life partially, you know, as long as I didn't have to sacrifice my lifestyle. So I was happy to accept Jesus as long as I could keep my worldliness around him. Um, so, yeah, my new belief system was as long as I pray, read the Bible sometimes, maybe attend church here and there, you know, that was good enough to get me into heaven. But, you know, as we all know, God is not concerned with legalism. And uh, clearly my life was continuing to bear the fruit of someone who thought they could measure up to God's standard of holiness, you know, based on their good their own goodness. Um, so in reality, nothing really changed. I just added something to my life that, that everyone else was doing. Yeah, you know, since everyone else advised me, oh, I need to go to church. Like, oh, well, God will. You know, I'm getting brownie points with God here. You know, this is great. Uh, but really, you know, God, like I said, isn't concerned with legalism. And Ephesians two eight is a great example. It says, um, "For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not 
from yourself, it is a gift of God. So, as you can see, I was working to gain God's favor and work my way into heaven instead of fully, tr fully trusting in Him. Um, you know, though I had made a profession of faith, I was still lost. But in God's kindness, uh, God showed kindness upon my life by giving me more and more access to His truth. You know, God could have left me in my self-deception, uh, but yet He was so kind that, you know, He didn't leave me. And as you can see, you know, when I get through my testimony, you'll see what I mean by that. Um, so anyways, as, as life continued, um, I still, I still lived what I think now was like the free grace idea. So I could do whatever I wanted because it would be forgiven anyways. Um, you know, of course I was happy to accept grace as long as, I, as long as it would excuse my sinful lifestyle. Um, so basically I had Psalm 37, four backwards, which says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Um, but clearly I was delighting in myself before delighting in the Lord and giving him thanks and all the glory for, instead of giving him thanks and all the glory, um, for what he did on the cross. Now I was trying to do all the work, doing all the stuff for me. And I was just always focused on myself. Um, but I remember in, when I got drafted, I got drafted in 2007 by the Florida Marlins at the time. And um, in 2008, I think it was spring training, um, one of my friends, or is it kind of a group of Christian friends on the team invited us to church um, and it was an evening service. And so I would sit in the church um, and the evening service at Grace Emanuel Bible Church would last about an hour and a half. Uh, 30 minutes of worship music and then pastor jerry would you know go on for another 45 minutes to an hour um and uh <laughs> so pastor jerry who was a personal assistant to um dr MacArthur for almost you know a decade he would preach and all i could think about was you know how bored i was and you know if you know pastor jerry he, he's like cream of the crop he's the best <laughs> some of, in my opinion you know the best of the best and but anyways, I was just sitting there thinking about how bored I was. I just, after, a, you know, an hour long of someone talking and, <laughs> you know, I just wish, at the time, I just wish he would shorten the sermon so I could go back to the hotel and hang out with the guys and play video games and just, you know, kind of do nothing. Um, uh, but each year, you know, in spring, I would come back and sit in there just to make, you know, the Christian friends happy, you know, just to appease man. And, um, but... You know, the Lord, again, he wasn't fooled. And in 2010, you know, a couple of guys confronted me at a, at a Bible study that they were having at Grace Emanuel, Darren Roberts and Matt Stanchek. And um, Darren, you know, if you look on the website, shared his testimony on here. It was an incredible testimony. But anyways, you know, solid, solid guy. And um, But these guys confronted me at this um, Marlins Bible study, let's call it, and um, they confronted me on how I was living in unrepentant sin. You know, they were concerned that I was naming the name of Christ while manifesting a life of an unbeliever. And I couldn't believe what they were telling me. You know, I just thought no matter what we did as, you know, quote unquote Christian, as long as we profess to believe in Jesus, then we are good and forgiven. Even if our lifestyle shows the fruit of someone who doesn't believe, you know, as long as you believe, you're forgiven. Um, but they let me know about a passage in James that, that you know, it rocked my world. And uh, to this day, I'm, I'm so thankful for it. Um, but it says uh, in James 2, I believe, is, but even the demons believe and shudder. And, um, you know, it hit me hard. And now that I think about it, you know, I, I realize that even the demons had a one-up on me. Not only do demons believe in the Son of God, but they also shudder. And, you know, at the time, I wasn't shuddering when I saw the warnings in Scripture. You know, I was believing in a lie. And after that, you know, I, <laughs> I avoided them in their instruction because I wanted to live in my own comfort. You know, I, I, I remember hearing what they were telling me and I know that they were pulling it from the Bible. So it had to have been truth. And I knew, I knew what they were telling me was true even before, you know, they confronted me. I just didn't want to believe it. I just wanted to, I, I was just so comfortable in my own sin that, you know, like who are these guys that are telling me this? But at the same time, deep inside I knew like man these guys are actually probably these guys are being loving right now and I just don't want to hear it but so that that really stuck with me for the next couple of years and I was just battling fleshly desires and idols but the word was starting to really jump out at me and convict me and I was just going back and forth back and forth and I lost a lot of sleep like I mean it was crazy um, and then in the game of baseball where selfish ambition is a tough battle I mean that, that just added to the fire you know and 
Um, but after a while, I found myself running to the word more and more when things were going tough. And, um, and you know, and through that time, I began to see my sin and learn what the Bible said about, about Christ. And my heart began to soften and change. And I started battling sin on some level. And uh, some of the areas that, you know, those men were confronting me on began to be areas that I wanted to see change in my life. So um, I got married in 2012. Um, and then in, so that same year, my wife and I moved back down to Jupiter. And uh, we, we went church hopping a little bit. And uh, I was like, you know what? I got to stop this. Like, I know a solid church that we need to go to, Grace Emmanuel. Um, and we're going to go there. And sure enough, you know, we, you know, we called that our home ever since then. But, um, you know, when we went, when we went back to GIBC, something uh, had begun to massively change in my heart. And I can know, I know it can only be a work of God. You know, I went from being irritated and bored by Pastor Jerry <laughs> to hearing the word in, in such a way that it sounded like beautiful music. I mean, it was incredible. You know, I had a hunger to hear more and more of it, sit under the teaching. Um, it was such a dramatic difference that not only did I go to the evening service, but I found my way to the morning service and the Bible study before it. You know, I just wanted to hear more and more. Um, so, you know, you might be thinking, well, I mean, that seems like a big difference, but, you know, really, what is the difference? And the way I'd summarize it would be First Corinthians 2.14, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So God in his kindness in the previous couple of years of my life had now opened my eyes and softened my heart to love him and love his word. Um, so, you know, it's funny. I could tell you what day to the day, I'm pretty sure, um, when I made the profession of faith in college. I'd say it's April 21st, 2006. But when I actually came to Christ, I, I can't officially tell you that date, which is incredible. Um, but I know it couldn't have been until I was willing to take full ownership of my sin and realize that the penalty for my sin was a just penalty, you know, where I would spend eternity paying for it in hell. You know, God would have been totally right and just to make me pay for my sins. And I know I, it couldn't have been until that um, I saw that Christ was the only one that could make that payment in place for this sin, for my sin. So, I don't know, maybe it was in 2012, maybe a little bit before that, but um, I do know this, that God had completely done an overhaul in my life, uh, and thankfully, because, the Lord's, uh, because of the Lord's unimaginable grace, I stand righteous before Him. Um, you know, and that righteousness I have is not my own righteousness um, that God um, Christ credited to my account. And so if you're, if you're listening in here today, I just want you to understand something, you know, I, uh, and I'm not boasting at all. This is something that God only, only the Lord could do in my life, you know? And, um, at, right now I'm playing baseball at the major league level, which, you know, and I'm, again, I'm not boasting, but the gift that the Lord's given me. And, um, I, you know, I play at the highest level that any, baseball player can compete in and it's more than a blessing to be in this league and on a major league team but really it doesn't matter because what Jesus did for me on that cross far surpasses uh, any game I could have played in I mean the game of baseball is temporary and someday you know baseball will no longer be an option for us be an option for me and um, what's funny is people won't remember who I am on the field uh, <laughs> they may uh, you might sit out there and, and be thinking, um, you know, that's easy for, for you to say, Steve, you know, you're playing baseball at major leagues, but remember when our lives are over, we can't bring, I can't bring my stats, my money, possessions, um, or anything like that before the righteous judge of the universe. You know, God is not going to take a second, you know, flip over my baseball card and look at my stats to see if I should, if he should allow me into heaven, you know, what is going to matter is that I've entrusted my life to Jesus as of Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection by faith, and that his righteousness has covered my sin and, and has been credited to me. And that's why, I, you know, I wanted to share this and share what Christ did in my life because he is eternal, and so are all of us, um, you know, here today. We will spend eternity somewhere. Someone is going to pay for our sin. Either we pay for it or Christ is going to pay for it. And apart from Christ, you know, my baseball career will burn up. Um, first John five eleven and 12 says, and this is the testimony, God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life, and he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. 
um, you know, that's my story. I just want to encourage you guys, anyone listening today, that if you don't know Christ, consider these things. You know, search the scriptures for yourself. You know, just listen to me and just see what God has to say.